Hello, Coindesk Live. This is Will Foxley, tech reporter here uh, for the ETH at Five conference. That's right. Ethereum is five years old this month. Might be a little bit crazy if you've been in the space for a while. Today, we're joined by a few DeFi characters, namely Robert Leshner of Compound Finance, Hayden Adams of Uniswap, and Rune Christensen of MakerDAO. Thanks, guys, for joining us today. I think we're all kind of jumping in right now. Uh, but just to give an overview of uh, the week and what we've seen so far, um, Ethereum has turned five. And, uh, you know, a lot has happened in the last five years from stable coins to DeFi. Uh, we're all over the place. And we're thankful to sit down with three uh, astute characters within the scene. Uh, I think we're just going to start with where were you guys at when Ethereum launched? Where were you as a person? Did you know about Ethereum? Did you not? Uh, what were you building or working on at the time? Was it even related to cryptocurrencies? So Hayden, can we start with you? I, yeah, definitely. Um, when Ethereum launched, I was in college and I didn't know a ton about it. Um, I wasn't very, I wasn't, I actually was not, you know, a lot of people in the Ethereum space were originally in the Bitcoin space and kind of moved over. Um, I didn't have much interest in Bitcoin either at the time. Um, I did have a friend uh, named Carl who was very, very into Ethereum and would talk to me about it every single day. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't sure about it. And, you know, I didn't really become interested in it until around 2017, a few years later, um, as, uh, you know, Ethereum started to take off a little bit further and, and get some, some more action. Uh, so that's when I kind of first became interested. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Let's move over to Robert. Robert, where were you when this all started? You know, I was not in the crypto space professionally at the time. I was, you know, in a, a Silicon Valley startup. And I remember reading the Ethereum white paper on Hacker News. Um, I knew about Bitcoin. I generally had seen a bunch of altcoins come and go. And I remember reading the Ethereum white paper and thinking to myself, wow, that's really complicated. Uh, there's no way that this is going to ship. And then it did ship and it was, you know, this sort of impressive moment to see, you know, a blockchain capable of supporting smart contracts um, go live. And, you know, it was, you know, obviously extremely early, a lot has happened since then, but it was really like an awe-inspiring moment. That's so awesome to hear. Uh, Christian, what do you have to say? Where were you when Ethereum launched? I heard uh, recently Camilla Russo's book that you were somewhere in China or the Netherlands at the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I remember when uh, you know, we went from the, I guess it was called the Frontier Network or something like that, the, the initial test net where there were actual real mining rewards back in the early days of Ethereum and then the, the real network got turned on. Um, and uh, yeah, at the time we were actually already, like me and, and the other co-founders were actually already in the trenches working on Maker and trying to get all this stuff to to work and uh, it was a very different experience than working in Ethereum today, that's for sure. It was like a very different community and you know the technical tools and, and sort of the, the environment of working on it was just yeah completely unlike what it's become today. Um, and it's pretty funny, it's pretty fun to, to have been a part of that journey. Also another thing to to mention is that uh, Maker is one of the few projects that were like listed on the original, the very first Ethereum website as like projects support, you know, projects built on Ethereum or something like that. And that's that's always I like, something I like to really bring up because of the, I mean, there's Augur as well, and I'm pretty sure every single one, or more or less every other project on that list, they're dead now. You know, not that many from the early days made it through all these years. Um, but yeah, it's been quite a journey. No, that's a great place to pick up because Augur just launched, as we saw yesterday, uh, five years after their ICO on Ethereum. And one thing that I think was pretty interesting, uh, just kind of digging through the old uh, Augur material, was that they tried to initially build it on Bitcoin and it took six weeks to build a specification working with uh, Paul Strzok's uh, Truthcoin, but it didn't end up working. And so they pivoted to Ethereum after talking with Vitalik. Uh, and they built their specification in 36 hours. 
So from maybe a technical or even a philosophical standpoint, what makes building on Ethereum a magical experience or a more easy experience compared to uh, other blockchains? And, and why can you guys uh, build on Ethereum? Uh, maybe we'll go to uh, Robert for that one, just to start off. I think the biggest advantage of Ethereum is that um, it's relatively welcoming um, to developers. Um, Solidity is not that different from languages that people know. Viper is an alternate language that people are able to use. You know, it's hard to write, you know, extremely safe code, but it's extremely easy to write code that can interact with any other smart contract on the blockchain already. And, you know, people are able to get products off the ground to test them, to experiment with them relatively quickly um, in financial applications. Um, and the biggest advantage that, you know, building on Ethereum has is there's already a landscape of applications to plug into, um, you know, that are permissionless and open. Um, and, you know, it allows someone to go to market without having to negotiate, without having to strike partnerships, without having to like ask anyone's permission or ask for favors. And that's really magical, um, in my opinion. Hmm. Aiden, you look like you want to chime in there. Yeah, just, you know, my personal journey in this is uh, maybe meaningful here, which is like, you know, Uniswap was essentially the first uh, computer program that like, or it was basically my first computer science project. Um, and, you know, I came into the space trying to learn Solidity and the project that I kind of selected to try, try learning was ended up becoming Uniswap. And what was so incredible to me was, you know, like Robert said, it's not that complicated to write Solidity smart contracts. So I was able to, you know, write smart contracts that, that whatever allowed you to swap between tokens and deposit liquidity. Um, and what was so incredible is that other people could use them and trust them without, without needing to trust me because, you know, they could see the smart contracts as open source. Uh, you know, I paid most of my, uh, most of the grant I got. So I got a grant from the Ethereum Foundation to kind of fund some of the development. I paid almost all of it or most of it to uh, smart contract auditors to kind of verify some of the properties. And so no one needed to trust me, um, but then those smart contract, uh, but I developed, I developed them and then those smart contracts ended up uh, trading you know, over a billion dollars uh, before we moved over to V2. And so just like the fact that people can kind of trust the code without needing to trust the developers um, is, is pretty imp incredible to me. And Rune, you have a similar kind of history where I think I was, again, reading in The Infinite Machine that you started working on these projects uh, just by yourself, met someone on Reddit who kind of helped you with the code. And before you knew it, you had something called MakerDAO and a few years later. Uh, and today it has over 1 billion locks uh, in capital. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the, the experience of building on Ethereum and, and why it's so easy to build, kind of touching again on uh, your, your first ICO or uh, with Augur and all the initial projects that Ethereum brought on? Yeah, I mean, the way I got, I got really drawn into it initially was also in the same vein as, as uh, Hayden and Robert, like the ease of, of getting into it. Um, what's funny is I remember back in those early days, Ethereum was really like branded, like, you know, like marketed in a sense as this is so easy, anyone can do it, you know, build a bank in five minutes, just write some code, you know, ship it and it works, you know, and, and I actually did that. I didn't even know the code and still somehow like I just read some guides and I actually made a, a, a stable coin that worked. I could, I even made like a front end and got it running on the test net and everything. Um, and it was great and, and like, yeah, I made some posts about it and that was, that was, the, was then what actually started making because some other people got interested in it. And then along the way, it was, you know, it was pretty good getting some other people in there because very quickly, you know, our, the, this fledgling team that would become the maker team started like realizing, wait, so this is not necessarily super safe, like a lot of this stuff, right? Like things, there's kind of like this indication that things go wrong, but we never actually imagined that we would see something like the DAO hack then happen, you know, one and a half years later. And, just totally like ending the meme that, you know, go ahead, write some code and ship it, right? But in, in fact, sort of turning the whole thing on its head and, and uh, also like getting, you know, like um, getting us to the point we are today where as, as Robert mentioned, right? Solidity is like a language that's like built to be really easy to, to write. It's not really that concerned about like security necessarily. That's kind of like a, something that's been added to it later, right? And that's, that's kind of funny because today that's what it's all about, right? The only thing people care about is how to make it secure. 
Um, but ultimately, I actually think that just like so, so you could look at look at that as, as saying it's like, well, okay, so Ethereum was like built the wrong way or something, like they didn't know what they should actually optimize for or something. And the thing is that like Ethereum was literally the first project ever doing anything like this, right? Like everything else that's come since is like a clone of Ethereum, right? And and there's not really been like a similar kind of like leap beyond what Ethereum did with with what became came before it, right? It's just been like copies and sort of iterations on, on Ethereum, right? And of course, Ethereum as being the very, very, very first one, is basically gonna be pretty much like rolling the dice on the random sort of way that, that things are stitched together and built together. And the thing is also there's been five years of, I don't even know how many people, right? Just like constantly building on top of this, constantly like figuring out the tools to get around the quirks to you know, deal with the issues. And, 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 and ultimately, and most importantly, um, it, where we get to in the end is sort of like to really understand what is it that makes Ethereum special is like, yeah, like the point Robert also made, right? That it's really not about the tools and the tech. Um, and in fact, I guess you can say the fact that the tools and the tech is a bit quirky and sort of like, um, you know, it's clearly a product, like, you know, result of this being the first ever uh, project of this kind. Um, that, I, I would say that that's actually sort of argues in favor of, of the strength of Ethereum because in the end, it's the community and it's the network and it's liquidity and it's sort of the existing um, familiarity and, and just like the existing ecosystem that is all of the value. Like, and, it's, and that value is just, you can't compare it to like the value of technology. It's something that's even more crucial than, than that, right? It's, um, um, and, and that's why Ethereum just keeps killing it, right? Because just, just you can't even, there's nothing like it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, in, in the maker and sort of me personally, uh, um, we actually like, we, 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 we thought that quite early on and that's why we thought that the stable fund was so important because, you know, it's gonna be really, you're gonna be in a really good spot if you get to, if you make a, um, you know, a like provides sort of an infrastructure on a network like Ethereum where all of this connectivity and liquidity and network effect is gonna end up being built over time. For sure. Kind of uh, taking a step back at the DeFi space in general or Ethereum, uh, just preparing for this conference and some other articles we've been working on in-house. I've been looking at some of Vitalik's posts from the early days, uh, and a lot of them are about financial contracts that you guys are building yourselves. You know, He had this vision six, seven years ago, uh, wrote about it, got people enthused about it, and here you are, uh, the, the builders of these dApps that uh, I can take out a loan with Ether anywhere and, and go buy something permissionlessly without a bank. Uh, so that's just pretty novel in and of itself. And, and that kind of leads me to like, I guess the general question is, has Ethereum always been about DeFi or is it just, we're waking up to it now? Has this last spring and like a DeFi bull run, as you could say, waking us up to what Ethereum is really about? Or is Ethereum more than that? Is Ethereum really about socks and crypto kitties and everything in between? Uh, Hayden, can we jump in with you there? Uh, yeah, I think that it's about both and everything. I, I think DeFi is definitely uh, what Ethereum is about. And I think that, you know, socks and crypto kitties are a part of that. Um, one way to think about it is like, you know, are we, like, you know, we're building a, a decentralized financial system um, that kind of supports, you know, a, a new kind of type of digital asset or token. Um, and so, you know, building, you know, a marketplace or a lending protocol or a trading protocol that also supports, you know, digital socks and this long tail of use cases. Uh, I, I think we're, we're moving towards a world of, you know, mass tokenization where everything that has value uh, is going to be tokenized. Um, and at the moment, it looks like Ethereum is the, at least in the lead in terms of where it's going to be to uh, tokenized. Um, and then having, you know, uh, all these tokens, um, one re really strong advantage is that they can all share common infrastructure. Uh, right now, you know, if you have a, a a sock, you know, if you're if you're trading socks versus, um, or you know, Starbucks points or airline miles or um, or Fortnite points or whatever it is, um, you know, everything is using like its own separate infrastructure and it's all closed off and, and you can't you know move between worlds. Um, and I think that the idea of, of DeFi is saying, well, we can build like one financial system uh, which you know uses standardized uh, uh, you know currencies and, and standardized digital asset types. Um, that lets you know everything use the same infrastructure and 
you know, if you if you make that permissionless and allow anyone to use it and anyone to participate, uh, you, you get this like really powerful global marketplace of, um, of, of value and of tokens. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing start to happen. Um, you know, definitely, uh, definitely something that really excites me. Yeah, I think we'll just keep going in the order that we have so far. So I guess, Robert, where, where do you see uh, this narrative, I guess, to use that belabored term? Is it, has Ethereum always been DeFi and we're just waking up to it now or is it more than that? Yeah, so it hasn't always been DeFi. Um, you know, it started off with a real generalist mindset that it would be the world computer, um, that it could run any and all applications that can make use of each other, that, you know, it's accessible by everybody and that, you know, it's a foundation for new applications to be created. DeFi, in my opinion, is the first sort of like sector of applications to really get product market fit on Ethereum. And one of the reasons why, in my opinion, that DeFi works so well is because, you know, it adapts to the sort of like circumstances of the blockchain. Um, for better or for worse right now, Ethereum, it's relatively slow and relatively expensive. And financial applications, you know, running on top of Ethereum might be relatively slow and relatively expensive relative to other, you know, applications on Ethereum, but they're extremely cheap relative to the traditional financial system where, you know, even though, you know, a transaction might cost $2 and it might take 45 seconds to mine, that's so much radically better than the existing status quo financial world. Now that's not great compared to a video game, right? If you're trying to use, you know, Ethereum to like play a video game, you're basically comparing it to things that are almost entirely free for transaction processing and much, much faster. And so that's why I think DeFi has found fit here um, is because compared to the alternatives, it's just that much better. Um, and so I don't think it'll be the last sector to gain sort of this like traction and product market fit, but it's definitely the first. Bruno, I want to pass it on to you, but I do want to note that you've been in DeFi perhaps longest for a product itself. Uh, Compound came out a little later, Uniswap came along a little later, but Maker's been there since 2015, right? So have you always seen Ethereum as a platform for decentralized finance, uh, or do you see it also as a bigger implementation for a global economy, like Robert and Hayden were saying? I mean, in the early days of Ethereum, it was definitely uh, the, the narrative at the time was certainly that it could be used for many different things. And I, 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 I seem to remember in particular that Vitalik seemed quite passionate about this. You know, let's not have it be all about money. You know, let's not focus so much on the money. Let's like think about how can we also help people, right? Like this is about technology that can change the world and so on. So he, he, I, just, I just remember that, that he, he specifically always wanted to like hold on to that, that the, you know, this whole life concept that it's not just money, it could do a lot of other things as well. I mean, from my perspective, I think exactly because of the argument um, that Robert made, it's been pretty clear that like basically money and finance is always going to be the, the low hanging fruit for blockchain. And it's always going to be like the, the fit that makes sense. And I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, right? I mean, that is kind of the, it's also just like money and moving around with blockchain. Right? That's, that's still where, that's where it's acceptable to have this incredible overhead that you have to pay if you want the same stuff to be you know computed thousands of times again and again right sort of uh, redundantly um so yeah i mean uh i'm not i'm not at all surprised with the sort of the direction things have gone uh i, I am kind of surprised with like the whole DeFi like meme or narrative i guess you can say right i mean makers Maker so old that Maker existed long before there was anything called DeFi, right? In fact, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the term DeFi was coined by, I think, like uh, Dama, the Dama team or something like that when, when they were doing, uh, you know, we were doing this like side event to DEF CON in Prague, I think it was, and then it was, you know, then they, it was going to be called DeFi. Sure, that sounds cool. <laughs> and then suddenly it turns out that this sort of small word DeFi just somehow like sounds really good or something and, and people really like it. And I mean, before we know it, I think now, now there's this talk about is, is DeFi just gonna become the new phrase that like describes what's currently referred to as either crypto or blockchain. I mean, we, we're certainly seeing right now, I mean, and this could very well just be a fad, right? But like today, if you look today, like 
anything that was doing a, a coin or a blockchain, you know, a couple of months ago, they're not doing a DeFi, right? It's like a de like it's not even like a real, you know, it's like a this amorphous concept where just anything is is a freaking DeFi right now, which is great, right? Because that shows that there's some traction, there's some excitement, right? Um, and 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 that also does come from the fact that this to 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 um, uh, Robert's point as well, right? That this is the one play, you know, there has been some real value created here, right? And there has been some like actual um, cool things that, that make sense. And it's it's more than just let's say ICOs, right? Or or speculation, right? There's actually, um, yeah, I mean, of course it's to some extent compared to where we're going next, it's still not really, like we still just scratch the surface of what this technology will do, but it's, I mean, it, it, it was certainly like, I think, you know, it's like a, it's like a special moment when people realize, that, okay, you can, you know, use, you can borrow with Maker, for instance, you can earn a return on Compound and you can like trade automatically on, on Uniswap, for instance. And the fact that you can sort of, you can actually do these things and it works and you can do it right now and you can tell your friend to do it and they can try it as well. That's, um, I mean, that is very powerful, right? And then what's happening in these last couple of months is just, um, now somehow there's this second wave of the narrative of the idea is kind of like catching up to the fact, okay, it, it, it was it was cool brand and there was some real use and there was some real growth. And now we can, we have this like crypto excitement is coming back and it's being funneled towards this particular space. And then I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if then that just becomes everything, right? Like everything just like finds a way to sort of like position itself in that new narrative. So Robert, the last time I saw you was at Zero Expo in San Francisco. And I remember on stage, you kept saying uh, one thing over and over again, uh, which was that uh, Compound is not going to launch a stable coin, if I remember that correctly. Am I right there? Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. So since then, we've seen the world turn upside down uh, and then do a few loop -de loops in between also. Uh, and one of those loops was DeFi launching, uh, becoming just like a mainstream meme. Uh, DeFi spring maybe could be something we could call it. Uh, so from your perspective, if you were gonna go back to Robert Leshner of six months ago, what would you tell yourself? Maybe from a technical position, maybe from a leadership position in your community, uh, maybe something in the macro picture you didn't quite understand about your project or other projects. Um, just kind of putting yourself back six months before all this crazy stuff happened on Ethereum. Yeah. So if I could go, you know, to six months ago, I would sort of have the same message and the same advice as I did then as well, which is the space is moving incredibly quickly. And that's both a blessing and a curse. Um, sometimes security gets forgotten um, when it gets caught up in the excitement of like, you know, new products, new features you know, high returns and all of these things. You know, the thing I would sort of stress to the community in the midst of DeFi summer is that, you know, security is paramount. Um, writing smart contracts that are safe, that protect user funds and don't have vulnerabilities should always come number one. And it needs to be the balance to the extreme enthusiasm that's starting to occur. And I think the community should, you know, spend more time talking and asking about security and everything that occurs. Um, in every new feature launch and every new product, you know, I think it needs to come back to being first. You know, the DAO hack many years ago, you know, slowed down DeFi by years in a good way, right? And I think the community needs to never forget that. This generation, you know, wasn't around for the DAO hack. Um, and so, you know, in the midst of this DeFi summer, you know, I would, you know, want to go back and just, you know, let people know that there's going to be mistakes and there's going to be flaws. And that they can be prevented. Um, but we as a community have to, you know, keep our standards incredibly high. Mm. We're gonna, gonna pitch it over to you now. In the, in the last six months, we've seen Maker go a lot of different places. Uh, we saw uh, some liquidation and collateral events in March. And then today I'm just like looking at DeFi Pulse right now. And you guys have 1.12 billion uh, locks on the network which is just insane. And then you also have uh, a lot of outstanding demand for DAI on tons of different projects uh, like Augur, which just added um, compatibility for your stable coin or the stable coin that you helped create. Uh, so if you're gonna go back six months ago, uh, maybe from macro standpoint or leadership position, uh, what would you tell yourself? 
I don't think that um, uh, there's really, even with with the knowledge of all the stuff that's been happening over the last six months, I don't think that we that would be um, necessarily that useful because the problem is really that many of the like all the, the the sort of like the challenges and the just like what's what's happening now, like sort of the the, the situation of this incredible growth that the whole uh, space is now facing. That's all something that we 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 you know we were prepared for and that we counted on and we expected to happen. We just didn't think it would happen so fast. Because the, the problem is there, you know, you, a certain you need to sort of build a certain number of things and prepare a certain number of things to sort of deal with um, with you know the actual challenge of scaling from a DeFi experiment to you know a DeFi critical infrastructure and 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 so on, right? And which you know, which most importantly means that now you can't just like fail or shut down or something, right? It's not wouldn't be good if if major suddenly, you know, stopped working or something, you know, you know, tomorrow, right? Like that's that's uh, uh, obviously the most important thing, right? Is this like stability, reliability, the, the fact that it's being built on people are counting on it and so on, and that's um, that's always been the goal and you know the main objective from the very beginning. That's always how we. We've seen it that Maker is all about like building this core infrastructure that can be relied on by others. Um, and the plan had always been to try to maximize that resilience and try to really like make it as strong as it possibly can be. Um, uh, you know, in, with sort of taking the path that will get us to that point as soon as possible and even culminating in the dissolution of the foundation, which is really seen as like this is the critical moment where we achieve like full maker independence, right? Where the community really has total control of the resources. They have all the tools they need. They have no dependence on external entities or, you know, individual parties or anything like that. Um, and then what ended up happening is uh, just even more extreme growth and sort of like sudden uh, uh, exponential uh, uh, sort of pickup of the space than, than we had expected basically. I mean, so it took us about, two years for Maker to get to 100 million died circulation. Um, and then, um, you know, after those two years, we then launched multilateral die, uh, which launched with, with Ethereum as collateral, and then also like bet one new collateral type to sort of test out this multilateral thing. And then uh, from then it took about, um, I guess, look, you know, five or six months or something. And then uh, the system hit 200 million die in circulation. And then it took about two weeks and then it just hit, you know, it hit 300 million die in circulation this morning, uh, European time. And in the evening it hit 350 million, you know. And actually uh, just uh, not so long ago, this um, like this extraordinary meeting of the community where um, some of the community members get quite together and they basically had this like, this uh, um, expedited meeting to talk about what do we do in terms of like changing the, the system parameters so we can accommodate even more growth in supply because it's just completely exploding right now as we speak basically. Um, yeah, and that, is, uh, that has been a, a, a crazy situation to be in. And I guess, like I said, I don't think that there's much we could have done to, to prepare for it differently. Um, I do feel that um, like in general, uh, while it's pretty crazy to be in the middle of all of this, um, I do feel very um, like relaxed or, or like confident by the fact that there's just way more professionalism in this whole space than, than there has ever been before, right? And I, I especially feel that, of course, in, you know, internally in like the maker community and the maker foundation and, and the people i work with myself but i even think like more broadly it's um it is just like a grown-up more like more grown-up industry um and uh, and i also think that that's that's a way that if you look at the DeFi sort of brewing a DeFi bubble or you know rally or bull market or whatever people are talking about now um i i mean i think there's a lot of parallels to draw with 2017 but i would also say that there is going to be a bigger level of substance and, and sort of like real value there and, and, and a little bit more maturity and professionalism than there, you know, than, than we've seen in crypto before. And that's, that's really good, right? That's, um, that's where we need to go.
Yeah, Rune, to your point, I think uh, over, like after the 2017 run and into the 2018 bear market, uh, there was just like a lot of professionalism built up within. And a lot of people started like working on projects by themselves. And maybe Hayden, you might be one of the best examples of that, uh, creating Uniswap and then in the last few months launching V2. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about the last six months for you? Uh, and then what would you change if you were going to change anything over the last six months? What did you learn over the last six months? Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about V2 and the success you've had with, with your project. Yeah, uh, definitely the last six months have been pretty crazy for Uniswap. Uh, it's gone from you know trading about a million dollars a day or a few hundred thousand dollars a day uh, to more recently trading about a hundred million to $150 million per day. Um, is what it's been doing in the past week or two, um, which has been pretty, you know, unbelievable to see. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, I don't necessarily think I would have done anything too different over the past six months. I, I do feel fairly, I don't have any like major regrets. Um, I might've gone back and, you know, started working on some problems that we're kind of starting to look at more now, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, something we've started to see is like a, a proliferation of tokens. So about 30 new tokens are being added to Uniswap every single day right now. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's so something that, and that's something that maybe Uniswap uh, faces uniquely, it, it, or not uniquely, but, you know, something that's very different, uh, a very different problem that Uniswap has relative to something like, you know, Compound or Maker, which have, you know, in a concept of pooled risk. And so you're always going to have like some sort of limited subset of assets where you care about. Uh, whereas Uniswap is like, uh, you know, basically anyone can add any new trading pair. Um, and that presents some really, really, really unique challenges. Um, you know, both like the quality of the, the token contract can create issues, uh, but also just like, you know, how do you discover what tokens are legitimate and what ones are not? You know, what we've seen with these DeFi tokens, every time a DeFi token spins up, you know, two or three fake versions of that token are, are put on Uniswap at the same time to try to confuse people and get people to buy like the wrong one or, you know, and, and so we're working on some, some uh, interesting ideas uh, on the front, you know, in order to kind of discover and, and figure out which tokens are real and which ones aren't and which ones have value. Um, so that's maybe something I'd start working on a little earlier. Uh, I would definitely tell myself six months ago, our full design for Uniswap V3, uh, which we're working on right now. Um, Any which, uh, I can't reveal too much of the details. Um, I'm, you know, we're probably going to announce it in another month or two, okay. hopefully. Um, but what I can say is that, you know, there are, um, whew, I, I don't know, it, it definitely starts to tackle some of the kind of issues that people point out with Uniswap, which is like capital efficiency, um, uh, you know, uh, execution efficiency. Um, there's definitely, you know, the, the things people complain about, about like slippage and, and you know, how much money you need to put, you know, in the contracts for kind of, uh, you know, the amount of value that can transact. There's some of these sort of like core issues. And um, while we've seen other projects kind of experiment um, with, with these designs, we've seen more automated market making projects kind of spin up uh, recently. Uh, we have a, a, a very interesting solution that we're working on, which we think is kind of a very unique um, and, and will kind of push the space forward. So we're, we're very excited about that. Um, and so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having a six month uh, head start on that as well. Um. Sure, sure. So kind of taking a step back and looking at the panel in general, uh, I think we're about a half hour in and before we get to some audience questions, uh, this is about unbanking or unbanking people. Like you guys are making bankless projects, right? We don't want to get Wall Street in here. But that doesn't mean you have, don't have anything to learn from them. So over your experience, maybe over the past few years or over the last few months, what have you guys taken away from your studies of the banking ecosystem or, or anything uh, in the current traditional financial markets? Uh, Rune, maybe we'll start with you there. Yeah, I think this, uh, I mean, you could say this question applies really well to Maker, but maybe the, the premise of like Maker being Bankless is uh, it also becomes a little bit more nuanced because um, it don't it, that, like the the really big um, takeaway that the entire sort of mega project has gone through actually from the, its very inception of like the very early days and, and started to think about this multiple level design and um, um, just like you know maturing and becoming more aware of what it will actually take to scale. Um, it's just continuously been like 
learning that, okay, actually a stable coin is quite similar to reinventing how finance already works and how money already works. And, and there's just so many parallels to draw that, that um, you know, it really does make sense to, to have uh, the traditional system be the starting point in many cases when you think about like what, what is it that people want when they're engaging with the financial tools, like what are they actually trying to do and so on, right? And, and, and uh, it may, you know, most of the time it makes sense to try to replicate that as much as possible. Um, and uh, and but so but but maker kind of takes it a step further because for us in the maker community, um, it's not just about you know replicating um, like what what they're doing out there in a bank or in the financial system and then re replicating that with some code and doing it on the blockchain. It's actually a lot more about. I mean, this is what the, especially in the foundation uh, recently. It's a lot. What we're really focusing on is how do we connect. What, what already is done with Maker and, and you know, sort of the protocol pretty much as it already exists. How do we connect that out into the real world and actually connect that to, you know, to banks and assets on their balance sheet or special purpose vehicles or stocks or whatever, any, you know, any real world asset, any real world um, economy or market. Um, because that's, from our perspective, that's actually what it will take for, for DeFi and for blockchain to get real, like it's about getting into the real world and sort of um, escaping the, what I would think of as like the crypto bubble, kind of like this ecosystem that exists right now where things are kind of like, you know, most of the stuff is happening inside the bubble, right? And things kind of like um, stay within the bubble very often. It's actually not so often that you see crypto really like reach out outside of the bubble or like connect out of it. Um, but the next, next stage, and this is what I think DeFi will really, um, will really, uh, you know, bring to the table or like, like create and especially Maker even, right? I certainly hope that Maker will be the big, um, you know, ice breaking ship that's gonna really uh, open up, you know, open this whole thing phenomenal wide open, right? By, by making, making it possible to take all of the efficiency um, that exists within DeFi, all of the innovation, all the transparency, security, just all of the advantages and then applying them in the real world to real problems so that DeFi really becomes about providing actual solutions for real people. And um, I, I think that's incredibly exciting. And I, I don't, there no, isn't really a place to start in terms of like, what can you learn from the traditional system? Because to some extent it's about like systematically applying DeFi and blockchain to every single aspect of what's there right now. And I always think of it as like, it's not about a revolution or like it's not about like pulling out the rocks from the banks or something or burning them down or something right and building something new it's about like removing the bad and enhancing the good like there's some bad things in the current system and there's a lot of opacity and there's a lot of corruption even right there's also a ton of good stuff and there's insane amounts of scale and complexity and you know just like thinking and and, and all of those things can actually be um, you know, built upon with blockchain and actually enhanced even further by, by sort of using the, you know, putting the technology into the places where it really makes a lot of sense. Robert, let's turn to you just as a lending platform and a place to acquire interest on uh, assets. What does Compound have to learn from the traditional banking system? Yeah, so the things that don't work about the traditional system are, and Rune touched on a lot of these, it's opaque, it's expensive, it's slow, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, annoyances, um, you know, there's a couple of good things though. And these are the things that we're trying to port into Compound. Uh, there's three things, safety, scalability, and predictability. You know, in a lot of ways, that means we want Compound to be boring. Um, and the things that work best about traditional finance are the things that you know are there, you know they work, and they're really not that exciting. And that's in a lot of ways our vision for Compound. We want it to be extremely reliable at scale where you know, you'll notice some of the experiments that you know, Compound has been conducting as a protocol and as a community, it's really designed to conduct experiments in can you supply you know, $100 million of assets and begin earning interest on them immediately? Or can you borrow $100 million of assets instantaneously and know that the entire system works? Um, and that's really you know, the best part that you know, we're able to replicate as 
a community and as part of DeFi is, you know, the primary complaint against DeFi from like traditional thinkers are like, oh, it's so small, it's a toy, it's unsafe. You know, we're trying to challenge each of these critiques one by one. Um, and, you know, to create in essence, an extremely boring product that any institution, whether they're in the old world or the new world, or they're a crypto custodian, or whether they're, you know, a startup wallet, whatever it is, they know that they can build on top of a protocol in DeFi. And that's, that's when I think we see this really, you know, 10 X from what we have today. Yeah. Just responding to that as a reporter in this space, I kind of hope DeFi never becomes boring, but <laughs> I, this is my take. Uh, Hey, I'm going to move over to you because Uniswap is so novel. Like it, it couldn't exist without this tokenized world. What, what can Uniswap pull away from the traditional markets? Yeah, I think that, you know, um, there, there's a few things here. Like I, I definitely get to echo what, what, you know, Robert and Rune both said, which is, you know, it is about, you know, finding what are the strengths of the, of the traditional world and what are the weaknesses um, and kind of applying those uh, to crypto, you know, trying to take some of the strengths and sort of integrate them and incorporate them. And then sort of, uh, you know, expanding on their capabilities by sort of exploiting the weaknesses of the traditional financial world. I, I, I see that as the best way to kind of grow DeFi. Um, you know, I, I do think uh, what kind of uh, Robert said about, you know, uh, like security and predictability, uh, you know, I think that at least you know, in the United States, um, not maybe everywhere in the world, you know, people have a very, you know, high degree of confidence that, you know, they'll, if they, if they make a small mistake, they might be able to get their money back still. Um, you know, Chase is in the background, like freezing your account so that before someone is able to steal it. And so like all that stuff is like a lot more sophisticated in the uh, traditional financial world than it is in crypto right now, where it's like, if you, if you make a mistake, it's gone and, and you have no recourse uh, very frequently. Um, so I think that that's an area where, you know, uh, d definitely uh, we could, we in the DeFi world can use a sort of, or can, can kind of take, uh, take uh, inspiration. Um, However, you know, I think that uh, where the DeFi world excels and is able to really, you know, outcompete the traditional financial world uh, is, is in a number of areas. So one area is definitely like permissionless asset creation and, you know, permissionless marketplace creation, right? And so, you know, right now there's uh, more, like, like I said, I mentioned earlier that, you know, there's 30 tokens added per day to Uniswap. If you want to know how many days are added or how many uh, assets are added to NASDAQ, uh, you know, it's, it's less per month, basically, than it is per day on Uniswap. And, you know, even with this like tiny subset of users uh, using DeFi right now, and even with gas prices being absurdly high. And so like, you know, uh, asset creation, marketplace creation, um, uh, other kind of areas that are, you know, uh, another kind of area that Uniswap sort of starts to expand on right now is, you know, uh, market making. Um, so right now, participating in market making uh, in, in you know, sort of like on NASDAQ in the real world is done by, you know, very few very like very wealthy, um, very like centralized groups, um, and and not very many. And your average person can't engage in those types of activities just because it is like kind of too sophisticated, um, and it's sort of all like you know background deals and like you know oh like Robinhood is selling priority access to its order books to kind of other market makers, and it's all sort of done in the background uh, by like a very small number of parties. And you know something that you can do with smart contracts and and something you can do with Uniswap is. Uh, you know, permissionless liquidity provision, automated liquidity provision, um, so that really anyone can issue an asset and then provide liquidity for it uh, themselves. And they don't need to be highly sophisticated. Um, you know, something that we can work on is, is sort of making it, um, I, I think that somewhere something, and this is something that we can kind of take inspiration from, uh, from the traditional financial world is kind of packaging maybe slightly more complex things uh, in more digestible ways. Um, to kind of even significantly uh, further lower the barrier of entry. And so what I'm thinking of there is like index funds. Um, where index funds make, you know, investing incredibly easy, uh, even though, you know, behind the index fund, there's like a ton of different things that go into it. And so I, I do imagine that, you know, with market making even, we can kind of significant, like even further kind of reduce the complexity so that people can kind of just like pool their money. Uh, it's just earning them a return. They don't need to think about it. Um, and in the background, it's kind of like replacing uh, these, um, you know, highly centralized, high, highly profitable professional market makers. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in kind of exploring that into the future. Awesome, thanks for that. So I wanna to turn to ETH2, of course, because uh, ETH is five, but ETH is also turning two. Um, hopefully this next fall, fingers crossed, uh, we know that 
there's a few different test nets. Yeah, Robert's definitely feeling that, right? Uh, so I wanna to turn to you guys and ask from a DAP developer's perspective, from a DeFi developer's perspective, what are some things uh, that you know about from ETH2? Because I think a lot of people don't understand that there's so many different people, so many different teams working on different things in Ethereum. The ETH2 team is way different than the people working on DeFi and they have no connection. But uh, I think that just kind of gets lost in all the, the magic going on. So, but from your understanding of ETH2 and what you're watching with that project, uh, what is a, a hard line or something that you need to see in ETH2 that you need to see going forward for your projects to succeed? Uh, Robert, I, I feel like you have a thought ready for that one. Yeah, so first off, extremely excited for ETH2. Um, you know, at a minimum, I think it'll relieve a lot of congestion in ETH1. Um, I think over time, we're going to see more and more use cases slowly migrate to ETH2. The thing that's needed for DeFi to move to ETH2 is really that composability that makes ETH1 magical to exist. And I haven't really seen how this is going to play out yet. Um, there's a lot of, you know, theory right now about how you can have, you know, one, you know, uh, set talking to another set and like all these things, but like that composability needs to be there. And it might happen in fits and starts. You might see some applications moving on to ETH2 and there being this island of new tech. Um, and you might see assets start to move on to ETH2 and you might see some like porting of like the value of different tokens that's been created. But really I think for DeFi to succeed, it's gonna have to be able to replicate that existing magic that exists right now on ETH1 that no other blockchain has. Yeah, that's uh, interesting you bring up the other blockchain part because uh, last spring I've covered probably five or six different blockchains that are trying to do what ETH is doing with um, DeFi. But that's a whole other conversation, so we're not going to go into it if that's okay. Yeah. Rune, can we jump to you for that question? What is something that Maker needs to see on ETH2 from your perspective? Yeah, I, have, I think I have a bit of a different view of um, ETH2 than, than most people. I mean, because so I actually, like, basically, from my perspective, it doesn't really, like, there's a bigger, how to say, like, there's a bigger disconnect between. So the ETH shock that everyone is building on right now, and then it's sort of like vision is ETH2 is just somehow it's what's already exists and then it's just more scalable at the end, right? That's kind of how a lot of people, like that's how what, what people think of it as. But, but the reality is actually that I think the entire challenge of, of scalability is not, it doesn't even really sit on the blockchains, it sits on the, on the apps themselves. So it's not really, like it doesn't really matter what, ETH2 looks like of what is built into the different blockchains or whatever. Like, what matters is what it's going to take for like the maker protocol to be able to, for instance, have vaults open on a different shot than the one where the, the primary governance layer sits, for instance. And that's just like, I mean, that's like a, a chat, like, that's a problem that's even further away, basically, than, than uh, even like ETH2 being finished. Um, and I actually even, think, I mean, I think that. The fact is today, rollups already available, right? So as far as I know, and admittedly, I don't actually know that much, but like, I think I'm, I am pretty confident that the functionality of like this kind of rollup is not really much different than, you know, how, a, how an ETH2 shot is going to look like. I, I guess you can't do the same level of like uh, coding and stuff on the rollup right now, but I think that that's also gonna be possible in the future. Um, but but my observation is that these rollups are not being used at all, really, um, which I think is a little bit that's a little bit surprising. But I think that actually shows that um, it'll be a lot harder than what people think. I mean, and that's entirely to Robert's point, right? So basically, I just agree with what he said, right? That like the the, the atomic you know the atomic possibility, this the fact that you can build things together in the way that you can on the on the on the main Ethereum shard. That is kind of the, the magic uh, to a large extent. Um, and, uh, and that, I mean, it's going to be a big challenge and it's going to be, I ultimately think that the only way you're going to be, it's going to be possible to replicate that is not, it's not going to be through the underlying blockchain somehow figuring out how to do it because I don't think that's even really possible. It's going to be the, the apps themselves somehow like starting to build in some sort of asynchronous way or something, right? So we can get, some sort of new paradigm for how we build our apps in such a way that they can seamlessly, uh, you know, interoperate even when 
it's not atomic and even if it from, it, when it's from one blockchain to another. And I also think once that reality happens, then uh, because it's happening at just as much on the app layer as it's happening on the blockchain layer, I also think that that does open up for more of like a multi-blockchain world, right? Um, I mean, I still, think, I still strongly believe that the, the roll-ups are gonna be the first ones that get filled up. I have a hard time imagining that like, they won't get filled up with activity, but some other random thing, I mean, even E2.0 uh, would happen just because they're available today. So that's where, if people need scalability, that should be where they're be, to be focusing today. And so I would expect that's where we'll see like the next frontier of scalability. Aiden, journey towards you, maybe from a Uniswap perspective or just someone who's interested in the space. Yeah, uh, I agree. Okay. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, I, I was gonna, uh, yes, I don't, I, I know. Okay, so I'll just go. Um, Okay, so first I'm gonna just like quickly say that like ETH2 is many things at once. In fact, there's like three specific like phases of ETH2. Um, and I'm also gonna mention that, you know, I think that I'm, I'm very bullish on ETH2 and I'm also very bullish on optimistic rollup. Um, and there's kind of a way that it all interplays together that I think can give you much of what we have on ETH1 today, but in a more kind of scalable context. Um, so when people talk about ETH2, they first talk about proof of stake uh, that's, you know, kind of this initial phase zero. And then they talk about, you know, proof of stake coming to consensus on, uh, on like uh, data uh, on shards. Um, and then the phase two, which is like the most nebulous one is like, uh, you know, proof of stake coming to consensus on execution on shards. Um, now, uh, the, the kind of optimistic rollup solution is a, is a layer two solution that only needs data availability on, on the main chain um, and execution happens off chain. Um, but otherwise, what Rune kind of said about it, kind of giving you a lot of, you know, you can basically build general purpose smart contracts on optimistic rollup is, is, is true and, and it can happen. And so, you know, what I'm kind of expecting to happen is we, you know, ETH phase zero, ETH two phase zero and phase one are both very well defined at this point, And they're really just in the implementation stage. It's only really phase two that people talk about being like extremely nebulous and hard to build on and complex with all these cross shard, cross -shard uh, transactions. Um, and so my hope is that, you know, and, I, and my belief is that over the next, you know, one to two years, uh, we're going to see, you know, much more sophisticated optimistic rollup chains uh, spin up. Um, and, you know, what optimistic rollup can give you is, you know, within an optimistic rollup chain, you can have composable uh, uh, smart contracts, uh, you know, written in a language like Solidity um, or Solidity itself. Um, and, you know, you, and those uh, kind of optimistic rollups can leverage shard chains uh, for data availability. And I, I'm expecting... I guess maybe on the higher level point here is that in order for something to kind of um, replace ETH1, it has to kind of do what ETH1 does, but better, which means it has to still let you just like spin up a new car smart contract easily. It has to let those smart contracts be able to interact with other smart contracts. Um, and, and I do think that like, you know, layer two leveraging the first two phases of sharding, but not the third is really where we're going to see like the magic happen and where we're going to see, you know, applications that can do thousands of transactions per second. Um, that still kind of have the DeFi magic. And I'm, I'm expecting that to happen by, you know, end of 2021 for sure. Um, in terms of like, I, I do know that there are several projects at the moment uh, in the kind of optimistic rollup space that are working to have, you know, full Solidity smart contracts uh, where you can just like compile this, this, the smart contract um, to kind of, uh, you know, some sort of other kind of uh, format basically that kind of lets it, um, uh, be based on like optimistic execution games, whatever. But um, long story short, I, I, I think that for, you know, I don't really think of it as like ETH2 is this standalone thing that like we're either going to join or not join. I think that like the whole space will kind of move to a solution that works. Um, and I don't think that anything will be able to replace ETH1 unless it can do what it can do better. Awesome. Thank you. So we got about five minutes left. Uh, I think I want to touch on two more questions, uh, one from the audience and one from me. Uh, first off, kind of gets going back to the ETH2 point, you know, there's staking returns, which basically means that the ETH2 network is going to give you funds for putting ETH deposits into the contract. And that's a way of validating and making sure that the whole uh, Ethereum base layer works itself. From a DeFi perspective, how do you even compete? If you're, if you're gonna get more ETH from staking, why would I put my ETH into Maker? Why would I put my ETH into Compound or uh, swap with Uniswap? 
Uh, Robert, can you bring us with that one and bring us up to date on, on, on your thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, there being a, you know, native return on Ether um, is a great thing. Um, it gives a lot of reason to hold Ether and it really, you know, adds a whole level of economics to the system that doesn't necessarily exist. Today. You know, you spend uh, gas to process transactions, it goes to a miner who sells it and the whole thing just sort of like, you know, spins in a circle and no one's incentivized to make transactions cheap. Um, and, you know, Ethereum is where it is today. Um, that return on Ether though in 2.0 doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from the risks and the work you take processing and validating transactions. And, you know, that's not riskless and it's not, you know, free. You have to provide a service to the blockchain. And I do think that in some sense that's competitive for a use of Ether. You know, Ether is gonna be in one place at a given time. It's gonna be used for proof of stake or it's gonna be collateral in a DeFi protocol and I think, you know, it's going to be slightly competitive because it's a whole new use case for Ether, but I don't think it's going to be a wholesale replacement. There's still a lot of people that want to use their Ether to borrow DAI or to borrow another asset from Compact. And so I think it's actually going to add a lot more nuance and opportunities to the ecosystem. You might see, you know, there being like more of a base interest rate on Ether in systems like Compact, um, where if anyone's able to borrow Ether, and put it to work, there might be more demand for Ether uh, through the interest rate markets. And so I, I think 2.0 is gonna add a really interesting economic design to the entire system that's gonna make it a lot healthier. Um, and you know, check back in with me in like two years. Well, I'll be back, don't worry. Hayden, I'm gonna jump to you really quickly and then we're gonna finish with Rune on that same question. Yeah, just um, I, I'll quickly say that like, I think that you know, um, definitely different protocols have different risks and different people have different risks. Um, our risk tolerances and, you know, kind of the, the general framework of, for interest rates is like, you know, the more risky kind of maybe the higher the, the interest rate, but then obviously you're taking on more risk. And, and the way that's all worked out is that, you know, if something is less risky and it has a higher rate, then it will, then people will move to there until it's arbitraged. And so arbitrage basically is just this magic thing that kind of makes everything work. Um, and, you know, if, if Ethereum is paying out, you know, a hundred million dollars in, in ETH per, per, you know, year in to, to kind of block producers, then there will be ETH that kind of comes in and fills that role. But similarly, if there's demand for lending, um, you know, people will come in to fill that demand and, you know, rates will kind of get arbitraged out based on, on risk. So I, I don't really see it as kind of competitive. It's, you know, we have government bonds and people still kind of, uh, you know, invest in them despite there being like, you know, other, like despite there being index funds and, and market making and, you know, all these other things. And so I, I don't really see it as competitive. I think that, I definitely see it as something that brings a lot of new value into the space. And uh, I, I, yeah. All right, non-issue. Uh, Ruin, let's, let's finish off the question with you. Yeah, you know, why not both? Um, you know, uh, staking pool tokens as collateral, right? That, that means you could, I mean, well, in, in short, right? It really means that you can give your ETH to someone else you trust uh, and they can then stake with that ETH, and you can get a you know you can get a token in return, and that token earns a part a portion of what they're staking, just like a mining pool, but it's a it's a staking pool. And then you could actually take that token and put it into to make it, for instance. Um, there's like there's some downsides to this, of course, right? So first of all, there's extra risk to staking, and there's extra risk to, like trusting someone else to stake for you. Um, and that would then also means that if you're trying to use this kind of token, DeFi would actually be more expensive, right? There would be like there would be less people, like le uh, less places and and, and uh, platforms that would accept it, um, and the rates would be higher compared to using like hard ETH, right? Um, yeah. And another another downside is that it could lead to some centralization, essentially, right? Where you, we see these like massive staking pools that. Um, have an, an advantage because their tokens are, you know, are, can be used as collateral. But then I think in turn that also creates this sort of opposite effect where the DeFi projects will tend to prefer having like a sprawling ecosystem of staking pools because they like to diversify their exposure, right? So you'd much rather have 10 different staking pool tokens as collateral than you'd have just one mega staking pool that is like threatening a whole network. Um, 
but that's that's really how I expect it to evolve. Evolve. Like I really think that um, uh, I guess I'm a little bit less on, on Hayden and, and Robert's side that like people will be, be fine just watching others mining, you know, staking and getting that that money, and they're just sitting on the sidelines and not getting anything. Um, I, I do imagine that you know pool staking is going to be very very popular. Awesome. Well, just to round out my last question for you guys as uh, the hours come to a close, uh, this has been compared by a lot of people to the new ICO boom, or this has been compared to just like, uh, it's just like a new, a new way for Ethereum to take off. So just wondering from three top heads of the DeFi networks out here, um, among others, what personal token are you guys putting your money on in the next, next six weeks, next eight weeks? You can decline the comment, of course, but... Wondering uh, what you guys are putting your money on these days. Hayden, maybe we can start with you. Um, ETH, 100% ETH. Classic. Nothing else. <laughs> Robert? Uh, I don't chill, so I'm going to refuse <laughs> to answer the question. <laughs> Rune? Oh, I think we got you in mute there. I think ETH is a, is a solid choice. Okay. But also, I'm... Uh, Really, really bad at trading and predicting stuff. I'll, so. I'll, yes, me too, by the way. Don't take my advice, but ETH. Okay, for sure. For sure. We won't take any advice. Uh, so Hayden, Robert, Rune, thank you so much for joining us at ETH at 5. Uh, be sure to follow these three on Twitter. Uh, they're different projects. Keep up to date with them. Of course, you can follow us on Coindesk, uh, where you'll see interviews and talks with uh, Hayden, Robert, and Rune, of course. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.